Today we are going to talk about this phrase that the Lord dropped into my spirit this week, just you know, praying about God, how do how do we how do we get the ball rolling into fall? And I woke up one morning with this phrase, the God gene. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. Turns out it's a whole thing. Some of you probably have stumbled upon this over the years. It's a book um, that was first released in 2004 called The God Gene. And we'll talk about some of the contents in there along the way. But essentially, there's this idea that is an undercurrent of the psychological world when people are studying how, how people think and why some people are drawn more towards faith things than others and whatever. And there's been all this scientific study towards, is there such a thing as a God gene or such a thing as some people are more drawn towards faith than others, which is very interesting. And so we're going to dig into that a little bit today, um, not going down the just the world of, of discussion and dialogue, but around what does the Bible actually say about this sort of thing? And it's very good for us to know because for all of us that are sitting in a room like this today, those that are watching online and searching out spiritual things and whatever, there's a lot of other people that are not yet. And yet there's a question that happens in all of our lives at some point where we wonder what happens after this where we wonder, is there more than this lifetime that I'm looking at right now? Is there more than just this perspective? St. Augustine, uh, one of his famous quotes from 400 AD, so that's a little bit ago, was, you have made us for yourselves, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. This was the conclusion that he had come to. You have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they find rest in you. Some of us have been victims of the restless heart for a very long time. And it's just, it's just this constant chase. We all know people who have the restless heart. That thing where there's got to be something out there. We're chasing something. Um, we've been like shocked lately at some of the um, movie previews. Uh, about stuff that's upcoming this fall, TV previews that are coming up, um, a particular um, event that's happening in, in Bonnet's Energy uh, Building Center, yep, in October that is all about witchcraft and hypnotism and stuff. And it's, it's kind of shocking where our culture is looking for some input of some spirituality. We need to find something. And when, when we look at it um, from a perspective of, okay, our hearts are actually craving, it makes a little bit more sense. Wayne and I had seen one, one preview for a movie that's coming up. Some of you probably saw it too because it was connected to some good movies this summer. Um, but we, we sat there and as, as it's going, like I'm like shutting my eyes. I'm like, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine how much prayer ministry we're gonna have to do after this one. Because honestly, people wanting an experience become oppressed. They, they encounter things they weren't prepared for and it challenges them and they can't sleep and they're tormented and things begin to happen in their households and whatever. This is the flow, but we, we have this craving on the inside, this push, this draw towards something. And so we've got to ask ourselves as people who are sitting in a building like this today, people who are watching online, why? Why are we here? Why, why are we pursuing God? Why do we look for spiritual things? What are we after? What's the, what's the draw? What is it that's the pull that's happening? You know, whether people are aware of God or not, what is the spiritual pull that happens? What is the thing that people are drawn into? And so today we're going to dig into that. Um, if you're somebody who's like, you want to process stuff, I keep your phone handy and just like screenshot. I'm going to give you some quotes and some stuff that will help you. Um, but let's, let's dig into this together. There is some God answers, absolutely, for the craving that we have on the inside. So Lord, today we just pray that as we go into your word, as we study, as we ask the questions, we thank you that you provide the answers. I thank you, Lord, that when we seek you with our whole hearts, your word promises us that we find you. And Lord, today, I pray that there would be a finding in you that answers the questions that we've carried for a long time. I thank you for precision in our thinking. I thank you for uh, individual revelation. I thank you as families, as parents, you give us direction and instruction today. And Lord, I thank you that you lead us into that place where our hearts have found their home in you, where we find our rest in you. And we just thank you for that direction and counsel today in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So when we look at the church thing, and I could go on for weeks about the value of being part of a church community, there's no question about it. There's no, uh, there's no lack of reasons why this is a good thing. I was talking to somebody the other day who was just saying that they had spent a season you know, out of church, started kind of with COVID and they just sort of stayed out and whatever, and then had come back into a church gathering in the last few weeks. And they're like, honestly, it's hard to put words on, but it's, it's so much different than just watching online. Everything has changed because I'm in this in this community, there's something about being together. So we could talk at length about what that is. There, is. there is a place of belonging. There's a place of stirring one another up, encouraging one another, praying for one another, supporting one another, instruction that happens. We learn and we grow. Iron sharpens iron. There's a place where your gifts make sense. There's a place where you're part of a, of a bigger purpose. There's a place where you feel seen and known. There's a place where what you carry on the inside has somewhere to to go. There's a place of purpose. And yet all of that, if we don't come to the anchor underneath it all, is just a social group. That sounds terrible. I do want you all to come back next week. But underneath it all, if we're part of a church and we grow in community and we feel valued and we feel like we matter and we feel like we have somewhere to serve and we feel like people see us, but we never actually meet Jesus... We've missed the point. And we could probably join several other community groups that would have a similar outcome on those fronts. The, the idea of the body of Christ, the church, is that it augments or it helps us in our walk with Jesus, in our relationship with Jesus, in our encounter with Jesus. We are here to support one another, to grow and to learn, to be instructed, to, to serve, to use our gifts, to develop because of the relationship with Jesus. And this is the core thing that actually we are craving on the inside, whether we realize it or not. Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except that no one can find out the works God does from the, uh, from the beginning to the end. In other words, there is something beautiful about your life that you won't even fully see until life has played out. But there's something on the inside of you that craves the eternal purpose. It's the exact same thing as St. Augustine says when he says that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. There's something that we crave on the inside. It's this eternity in our hearts. In the New Living Translation, I love how it's broken down there. And it says, for everything there is a season. Uh, yep. Nope. Yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Isn't that beautiful? God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. Lou Engel puts it this way, and for anybody who doesn't know Lou Engel, he is a man of prayer. He has led generations in extreme prayer for, you know, for people groups, for the nation, for a generation to rise. And he says this, before you were ever born and conceived, God had a dream about your life and wrapped a body around that dream to fulfill it. Isn't that beautiful? That's essentially what Ecclesiastes is saying. Before you were ever born and conceived, God had a dream about your life and wrapped a body around that dream to fulfill it. He's speaking as well of Psalm 139, 13 and 15 we're going to read. For you formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of of the earth. There's this thing that when we can understand, I'm not here by accident. I'm not here because of people's choice. I mean, the, the God spark that brings life is only generated by God. So when we understand that, we have to know that we're here on purpose for a purpose. And that purpose makes sense in connection to God. It doesn't make sense when we're just trying to find validity to our own journey, when we're just trying to find something that makes us feel good. When we find the anchor in God, in that place where our heart finds its rest in him, everything settles down on the inside. 
the, the specific creation. And some of you, you're like, I've heard this forever. Maybe you just need a reminder today because some of us also have never heard this before. The truth is nobody is an accident. Nobody is an accident. We are here now on purpose, with a purpose, and that purpose is contained in the heart of God. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created them. One of the things that's happened in society, and it, it happens in blips of time you can see over history, is the, the pulling away of the value of mankind, where we feel like the nature, the created thing is more important than people are. And so, uh, you know, you've, you've seen um, all the different things where there's fundraisers for like abandoned animals or, um, you know, things like that, where there's... there's um, you know, puppy mills or whatever, really horrible things for sure. The stats on it are that really people respond quicker, faster, and more generously to animal causes than people causes. Something's wrong in our thinking when, when we don't really understand that, when we have a society that takes things like the Sound of Freedom movie and blocks it for five years so nobody knows what's really happening to children around the world, when there's this push to silence what is happening uh, to mankind under the hands of tyranny and on the ha under the hands of abuse. There's this blockage that happens. But we are all about rescuing animals and trees and whatever. And I'm totally an animal lover. Like, I cry over all of those little videos, too, and I've given. But honestly, this is the core thing, is that men are made in God's image. People are not or uh, animals are not, trees are not, the earth is not. The earth is made out of God's creative side, his creative expression. The, the trees, the animals, the diversity of the earth is made out of his creative expression, but we are made in his image. That's massive. That is why we can say, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I, I can look like King David said, look in the mirror and be like, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That my soul knows very well. Why? Because I'm so great? No, because I'm made in his image. The, the, the way I function, the way I am designed is to function in a way that reflects who God is. That's incredible. That, that, the idea that God would actually put his fingerprint on our lives is this incredible truth. And when we're willing to receive it, when we're willing to accept it, it makes so many other things make sense. There's a, a philosopher from the late 19th century. He said, instinct leads, logic does but follow. Instinct leads, but logic does but follow. So uh, the idea of instinct is the actual definition of instinct, a natural or inherent aptitude, impulse, or capacity, behavior that is mediated by reactions below the conscious level. So instinct or a natural or inherent aptitude, impulse, or capacity below the conscious level, it leads and logic follows. So when people wonder why, why do people keep drifting into spirituality? Why do people keep, like literally pretty much almost every time we post a video online somewhere, somebody's like, so I don't understand why you're after this imaginary God of yours. Because he's not imaginary. He's very, very real. And there's something on the inside of us that knows it. Why do people keep pursuing things of faith, keep pursuing things of the spiritual realm, keep pursuing things of the invisible? It's because the instinct is there. There's something on the inside of us that absolutely cries out for more, that knows there's got to be something more. I, there, there is a draw when you come to a near end of life situation that automatically knows there's got to be something more. There's got to be something that happens on the other side of this. And it, it stirs up on the inside. People have these encounters when they are in nature, when they see the beauty and the creativity, when they see animals follow the paths that they shouldn't naturally follow. Like why, why do salmon swim upstream to give birth? Who told them to do that? 
Why do they do that? You can't explain the instinct unless it's put in there by something that's bigger than them, right? It doesn't make sense. We've all seen, unfortunately, the geese are starting to gather again already. I know. Why are they doing that? They're preparing for this flight south. Maybe some of us are as well. <laughs> They're preparing. Who told them to do that? Who tells them it's time to get together the fam? You know, you're going to, the more of you that are in the V, the easier that flight's going to be. <laughs> less, less time you're going to have to spend on the front of that thing. It's time to get together and you're headed to Florida. <laughs> You know, who tells them that? There's an instinct that is in there that has to come from somebody bigger than them. What makes us choose love? What makes us choose mercy? What makes us feel? What makes our hearts beat for the things that are, are brokenness? Why can't we just walk by and do nothing? Now, sometimes along the journey, our instincts get broken by the damage that happens. But the core instinct is there. I think there's this, this interesting thing. I, I mean, everybody has had some kind of a near-death experience driving in Grand Prairie. Um, and we all shout something. I, I have noticed, and I'm, I'm pleased with, with, in my own life, probably it hasn't always been the case, but... Somebody cuts me off, and I'm just immediately like, Jesus, help. An ambulance goes by. I'm like, God, be with them. Like, it's just, it's just this instinctive thing. And I'm starting to notice how more and more it's just this, this place in my life where I know that if there's going to be something go wrong, I can't solve it. Cussing at people is not going to help. Waving a certain finger is not going to solve any solutions or create any solution. There's nothing that's going to help except Jesus. I, I was uh, driving the other week and it was just like, literally the traffic was so, it was so full in GP and people were like, you know where you should have predictive driving, where you slow down a little bit before an intersection. People were like, drive, stop, drive, stop. And I'm like looking in my rear view mirror and the, the, like, the cars are just like so close to crashing. And I'm just like, Lord, I'm just going to need a bubble. Like, I just, I just need a spiritual, and I mean, to some that might seem weird, but I'm like, literally, I can't be a defensive driver enough to get through this right now. These people are crazy. And I'm, I'm sure it wasn't my driving. It was everybody else's, but it was like, I, I need to get home today in one piece. Like, Lord, I need your help. I've been to doctor's appointments where they're like, you know, well, I think we really need to check into this. There's something seems a little off. My instinct is... God, I need your intervention. God, help me. Where is your place that you go? Who is the person that you call out to? What's the answer? What's the, what's the thing that comes out of your heart? Because it's meant to be the one who's the source of it all. It's meant to be the cry to the place where your heart finds peace. But we try all sorts of things. In our, uh, in our hospital at present, we don't really have a chapel at the moment. We just have a reflection center. Let me tell you, reflecting isn't going to help you. Sitting and thinking isn't going to help you. You need prayer. You need to take it. We need to take it to somebody who is higher than we are, somebody who is bigger than we are, somebody who actually has the answers. The Angus Reed Institute did this study, and it says prayer habits tend to be the strongest in this country, specifically about Canada, during childhood. In fact, nearly six in 10 Canadians say that they prayed once a week or more during this period of their life, significantly more than those who say they prayed often in adolescence or as an adult. In fact, adults in Canada, uh, of adults in Canada, just one third say they pray at least once a week. Interestingly, childhood prayer habits are strongly correlated with both the likelihood and frequency of prayer as an adult. Prayer habits tend to be the strongest in this country during childhood. What does that tell us? It tells us that when we are closest in the timeline to the one who created us, to the one who knit us together in our mother's womb, 
to the one who says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, to the one who has us in his heart. When we are closest to that point in the timeline, he's who we cry out to. And the further we get down the path, the more we rationalize out if it makes sense or not. Is he actually there? Is he actually interesting? The more hurts we experience, the more damage of a broken world, the more places we bump into people who have, who have maybe been hurt or created hurt in a faith environment and we decide to shut down. There's nobody answering on the other end of that prayer. You might as well save your breath. But when we're little, there's something in us that draws us towards the divine. There's something that draws us towards the answer. Why? Because eternity is hidden in our hearts. Because there literally is a space that we are called to live with him. I think it's very interesting that it says the more that prayer is like consistent with children, the more it affects their adult prayer life. For parents, this is, this is the diagnosis, is that we need to have prayer in our households. We need to be teaching our children, not just that it's important to come to church, not just that you have to be a youth group. We need to teach them to pray. We need to teach them that God's the one you call. We need to teach them that we have a family altar in this house and we pursue him, that God is the one who has the answer to the cry that you have. God is the one that you go to when you're broken. God is the one that you go to when you're scared. God is the one that you go to when you need hope. It's not just that you have to come to church, but you need God. So the longer and the more consistent that prayer is in childhood, the easier it is to maintain it in adulthood. Very interesting. So I want to just read from Romans 1, 16 to 25, and in the Message Bible, so we'll put it up on the screen. This is a very interesting breakdown of how the, the, the actual gospel looks. Instead of just saying it's really important that we're good people and we attend church regularly and whatever, we actually have a deeper calling to know God. This is Paul talking, and he says, It's news I'm most proud to proclaim, this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him. And in the, the New King James and other translations, it says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. Yeah. Some of us, like that phrase is so, feels so churchy, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, this is what it means. It's news I'm most proud to proclaim. Honestly, there's nothing embarrassing about faith or Christianity. It's something that we should be proud to proclaim. God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him, starting with Jews and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in the acts of faith, confirming what scripture has said all along. The person in right standing before God by trusting him really lives. This is truth. But God's angry displeasure erupts as acts of human mistrust and wrongdoing and lying accumulate as people try to put a shroud over truth. But the basic reality of God is plain enough. Open your eyes and there it is. By taking a long and thoughtful look at what God has created, people have always been able to see what their eyes and such can't see. Eternal power, for instance, and the mystery of his divine being. So no one has a good excuse. What happened was this. People knew God perfectly well. But when they didn't treat him like God, refusing to worship him, they trivialized themselves into silliness and confusion so that there was neither sense nor direction left in their lives. They pretended to know it all, but were illiterate regarding life. They traded the glory of God who holds the whole world in his hands for cheap figurines you can buy at any roadside stand. So God said, in effect, if that's what you want, that's what you get. It wasn't long before they were living in a pig pen, smeared with filth, filthy inside and out. And all this because they traded the true God for a fake God and worshiped the God they made instead of the God who made them. The God we bless, the God who blesses us. Oh, yes. Literally, this is the progression of mankind. Where in the beginning, everything we could see has the fingerprints of God, in, including now. When you, when you look around and you see stuff that you can't explain and the fingerprint of God is on it. But for all of history, we have done these things where we just shut him off and we decide to be smarter than him. So let's dig into this God gene thing a little bit. The guy who uh, did the study and wrote the book is Dean Hamer. 
a very educated, very schooled man. But essentially, he, he had this interesting revelation where walking through like, you know, again, because he was, he's a very heady kind of guy, walking through history, walking through, what do you call him? Archaeological, thank you. Archaeological sites going back as far as where they can put, see the fingerprint of man. There have been in different forms and different shapes and different ways of explaining it, a, a directional point towards deity. People have found ways of worshiping and come up with their own expressions of it, but essentially right from the beginning of time and literally all over the earth, people have sought to worship a deity of some kind. They have sought to worship. There has to be an expression of the heart towards something. So sometimes it's multi-gods, sometimes it's towards creation, sometimes it's towards God himself, but the expression is there. There's this thing in man that has always known there's something more, and it tracks through all of history. So this this idea of um, worship isn't new. When people go, well, here's the track record of Christianity, and here's the track record of Judaism, and here's the track record of Islam, and here's the track record of Hinduism and whatever. The point is, from the very beginning, all of mankind has known there's more than us. Our spiritual convictions remain as strong today as they ever have. So here's the stats on it. Surveys show that more than 95% of Americans believe in God, while 90% meditate or pray. 82% say that God performs miracles, and more than 70% believe in life after death. So that's, that's American stats, and it's obviously a little bit old. But this is the numbers, is that there's this core thing. We, we would say that most of society believes that there's a God of some kind, that there's somebody out there, they pursue something. Uh, church attendance, however, has been declining. More and more people feel that churches place too much emphasis on organization and not enough on spirituality. One Gallup poll says believing is becoming increasingly divorced from belonging. People are becoming less interested in the church and more interested in the spiritual. This is basically what Paul wrote in Romans, that people began to worship the things they created, began to worship the stuff that they could see around them instead of the one who created it in the first place. They became so smart in their own minds that they invented the things to go after and they dabbled into stuff that they never should have dabbled in. But the reality is the relationship with Jesus is the pure lifeline. So the spirituality thing is a very, very big deal. It's why when we see like, why, why are these kind of movies coming out? Why are these kind of TV shows coming out? Why are people involved in this and that and the other thing? Because we crave spirituality. But the body of Christ has to come to a point where we are not ashamed of the gospel, where we tell the truth of what it really is. Because essentially... This guy is like coming from an outside situation. He's wondering, why do people, why are people so drawn to faith? Why do they need it? Is it a crutch? Is it an internal, like they just have to have something to lean on? Why do they do this? He literally asks, why is spirituality such a powerful and universal force? Why do so many people believe in things they cannot see, smell, taste, or touch? I argue that the answer is at least in, in part hardwired into our genes. Spirituality is one of basic human inheritance. It is, in fact, an instinct. That's what his studies show. Then he tries to figure out how this happens. What's interesting, when he says, why do people believe in things they cannot see, smell, taste, hear, or touch? The answer from the Christian perspective is, that's not true. Psalm 34, 8 says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who, sees, or who trusts in him. The reality is when you come into relationship with Jesus, and some of us have been there, some of us are in process, some of us need to, to have this experience, but when you know Jesus, you do feel him. You do hear him. 
You do sense him. You do see him at work all around you. You do hear his voice in the things that you're, you're seeing and doing. And when you ask him, prayer is an interactive language. It's not this imaginary thing where we come and we just give ourselves to something that is dead or demonic. It is something that is life-giving. And so any solid believer would tell you that this is not just faith for faith's sake. It's not just needing something to hang on to. It is the source of life. And it brings peace and he brings joy and he brings, he brings hope and he brings perspective. He brings clarity. He gives the ability to love when love isn't possible. He gives the ability to forgive when forgiveness is unthinkable. He gives the ability to move on and walk in strength when you should have quit days ago. He is next level encounter with the divine God himself. It's not the same thing as just having some urge on the inside to believe in something bigger than me. It's an actual relationship. So as he's studying out this thing, this guy in the God gene, he talks about um, he sees it the same as birds. And why do some birds sing a certain song that's different than other birds? They all technically have the same vocal cords. They should be able to make the same sounds. But why do they make their own song? What makes them respond in certain ways? And so he kind of connects the two and he says part of it is obviously just instinctive, but part of it is nurture. Part of it is that they heard their parents sing it. Part of it is that they're in an environment that hears this particular sound and so they emulate it. They take the basic ingredients and they look to repeat what they've just heard in their, in their family line. Which is so interesting because when the word of God tells us to, about children, he tells us to raise up a child in the way they should go. And when they're old, they will not depart from it, right? It's the same thing as when prayer is solid as in childhood, it becomes a solid practice in adulthood. This process, it's something that, yes, there is some nature connected to it and there is some nurture connected to it. And all of that is of God. God speaks into all of it, which is so interesting. This is why when we're in this moment of time where we, we are deciding what to do with our kids, our families, our resources, so much is going on around us. Um, I thought it was interesting when Jordan spoke and he said, I forgot how busy it is up here. I forgot how, like when they moved back up here, I forgot how busy it is. We have this thing where honestly, uh, Labor Day weekend tomorrow, most of us are trying to just breathe deeply because it's all on, on Tuesday. Everything starts on Tuesday. The world just goes. And up here, it's a big thing. And we have this culture that wants us to put our kids in everything. We need to be part of everything. We need to be busy, busy, busy. Your kids need all the opportunities. Maybe they're going to be a famous this or going to be a famous that or whatever. I actually looked up the stats. Just so you know, the odds of your child playing pro football are 0.08%. The odds of your child playing pro basketball are 0.02%. So better-ish, kind of, well, nah. The odds of dying and facing an eternal future, 100%. So where do we invest? What do we make sure our kids know? Where do we make sure that they are? What do we pour into? What's worth the time and the effort and the money? And I'm not saying that football and basketball and hockey and all those things are bad because they're not. There's all sorts of other things they learn, teamwork, sportsmanship, you know, perseverance, all those things, absolutely. But I'm saying there is a 100% guarantee we're all gonna die. So what are we investing in? What matters if... if psychologists, and, and remember, we're talking, like some of these quotes already, we're talking over the course of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, different levels of understanding, different levels of perspective, different ways of viewing things, people who are Christians, people who are not, people are complete secularists, whatever, but they all come down to this same thing, that there's this core that seems to be on the inside of mankind that craves the divine. If your kid has that, you have to point it at something. You have to give it direction. 
you have to help it find a landing pad. We've got a, a current place in our society right now where it's like we don't want to force our kids to do anything because we don't want them to hate it. So we don't want them to force them to eat the things they don't want to eat. We don't want to force them to wear the things they don't want to wear. We don't want to force them to go to the places that they don't want to go. We don't want to force them to talk to people that they don't want to talk to. All of these things, we don't want to make them, we don't want to make a choice of faith for them. If biblically, spiritually, psychologically, scientifically, the background is your kids are going to search for something outside of themselves. Guaranteed, you better give them something to chew on. You've got to put some tools in their hands. You've got to decide that this is worth it. You've got to help them navigate these crazy waters that are in front of them. I'm not talking about proselytizing your kids. I'm talking about passing on an inheritance. I'm talking about if we can break through in one generation into freedom and love and joy and peace and kindness and fruitfulness in our homes, the next generation walks in the blessing of that. What a gift. That's not bondage. That is a gift, right? That is a gift. This is what God's calling us to. We have to understand that it's in there, though. Some of us who grew up in the church world, we, we grew up hearing this, this phrase that, you know, everybody's got a God-sized hole and only God can fill it and whatever. And we started to tune it out because it sounded so cheesy. It was on so many, like, weird posters where there's, like, a cross on the, like, an empty cross on the front of somebody's chest or whatever. And it was just weird. Um, but the reality is that is, a, that is like a subtext of a, a way of saying this, that we actually have a craving for God. We literally actually have a craving for God. Blaise Pascal said this, and this is like 1600s. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim? This is just a philosopher. Not, this is not like a priest or anything. What else does this craving and this helplessness proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness? Like the first three chapters of the book before we blew it. Of which all that now remains is the empty print and trace. This he tries in vain to fill with everything around him, seeking in things that are... We have this spot. In fact, this is the quote that generally that we have a God-sized hole comes from. We have this craving, the empty print and trace we try in vain to fill with everything around us. Many of us have been there. We have filled it with pursuit of productivity, financial gain, self-help. We've pursued drugs. We've pursued sex. We've pursued alcohol, we've pursued unhealthy relationships, we've pursued all kinds of spiritual dimensions and higher levels of learning, we've pursued all the things. At the end of the day, we come to the spot where actually there is no answer, but the fact that God fills this space. God and God alone fills this space. This is something that eventually we all have to come to this revelation. Some of us come to this revelation on this side of eternity and unfortunately some come to it on the other side but we all will come to this revelation it's just part of the flow because nurture shapes and expresses nature parents who help their children experience God who help them find Jesus create a paved path that makes it easier and easier for the following generations when we experience Jesus when we live in the light, we are transformed by that love and it changes things. We have, to, we have to decide to live in that ourselves. Some of us, and I'm just gonna be like, don't be offended, this is, this is helpful. Some of us want our spouses, our kids, our extended family, our neighbors, our friends to change, to do the right thing, to make better choices, but we're not living fully in the light. We haven't embraced Jesus as the center of everything in our lives. We add him on. We show up on Sundays. Maybe we're really regular in the functions of the church, but unless the relationship with God is active, we're not bearing the kind of fruit that they want to emulate. 
So when we want to see the change around us, literally the old phrase, to see the change be the change. Live in that place where you have surrendered to God and let God handle some of the stuff around you that you've been carrying and walking around with as baggage. You're not responsible to carry everybody else into the good life that you, you dream for them. You're responsible to live in the light, the plan that God has for you. And out of the fruit of your life, you will affect change in those around you. And you will not be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but you will share it. You will know that it is the power, that it is life, that it is good, that it's gonna change things. You'll speak it with a grace and not judgment. You'll speak it with kindness and not, not a savagery. You're going to speak it with a, a gentleness that gets through to the heart instead of a judgment that shuts people down. We have to decide to live in the light in this place. When we experience God through the lens of religion, the lens of just packaging and not relationship, it's judgmental, it's harsh, it's cruel, and it's dangerous, and it turns people away. There's this uh, quote that uh, C.S. Lewis said that I think is so interesting. He says, of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. <laughs> Y'all feeling that one right there. Of all bad men, religious bad men are the worst. Honestly. So what we're talking about today is not like, a man, I found religion. I found a church. No, you need to find Jesus. And Jesus will transform the things in your life that need transforming. Do you know, I, I used to have a terrible anger problem. I used to have this thing. I, I just call it a spirit of rage. I believe I was delivered from it. But I would have points in time where there were things that would just set me off. And it, I mean, didn't always see it coming. It wasn't like a buildup of anger. But something would just set me off. And I, I would yell and just... Ex express um, and almost from a perspective of like I could hear myself from the outside but I couldn't stop and I know some of you have experienced that with alcoholism with addiction with various things do you know one prayer session one encounter with Jesus and that thing left me yeah. completely like now, if I'm angry about something, what the word talks about when, you know, be angry and do not sin. If I'm angry, I'm just angry. And it gets resolved and it's over. And there's no, there's no overwhelming expression of anything. It's just an emotion like sadness or joy or any other feeling. It's just part of the process. And it's, it's measured and it's controlled and it's healthy. Some of us feel like I am just so far gone. You don't understand I'm telling you, if you will give Jesus access, he will change your life and your changed life will affect those around you. Your changed life will affect your spouse. Your changed life will affect your children. Your changed life will affect your grandchildren. We want them to change, but honestly, it's in us. It's on us. If you got like lust issues, you've got addiction issues, you've got whatever, this is the time. I'm telling you, there's something on the inside of you that is gonna hunt for something on the outside to pacify it, change it, fix it. Some sort of a program, some sort of a system, something that you can purchase to make yourself better. Just come as you are and give the creator access to what's going on on the inside of you and he can heal it. He does deliver. He does set us free. He does move us into places of hope and joy and love like we never would have dreamed. I'm not saying this because I just think it's a, it's, you know, it's a great possibility. I live it. We live it. Our family lives it. The people in our lives live it. There's people in this house. You are living in the light. You are living in freedom. You're living in a life that you never thought was possible. If you can bounce yourself back in your mind 10 years ago, you would never have pictured who you are today. And it's not because you did so well pulling yourself together. It's because Jesus transformed your life. Seriously. Seriously. Do we not want that for those around us? Do we not want that? So we have to decide that this is where we're headed, that this is the place that God's calling us. When Paul was, was talking and he, he was meeting this group of people who were philosophers and they worshiped all the stuff, Acts 17, uh, 22 to 25, he stands there and he says, men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. 
As I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made of hands, nor is he worshipped with man's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, all things. He gives it all. Paul was saying, like, honestly, you've got this level of mysticism and this level of mysticism and this level of mysticism. Many of us in this room have encountered all kinds of different spiritual entities and spiritual experiences, but you know it didn't bring you freedom, life, or fulfillment. Jesus is the only one who can. And if this group of philosophers had found the answer, they wouldn't have left the, the uh, inscription to the unknown God. They knew something was missing. When you find Jesus, you find he's everything. He's the whole deal. It's the only place where we need to go. There's an old hymn by Fanny Crosby. She wrote it like a long, long, long time ago. And just the phrase of this rotates in my mind from time to time. It starts off and it says, tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story so precious, the sweetest that ever was heard. Isn't that beautiful? Don't tell me the story of why your church is so great. Don't tell me the story of why that program is so necessary. Don't tell me the story of why you feel like everybody should sign up for this. I mean, we're going to have announcements in the next couple of weeks of things that you can be part of. But ultimately, my heart would be that every one of us has been told the story of Jesus. Yeah. Literally the one who gave it all for us because in our brokenness in that description that we hear about how literally all of history has been there's got to be a god i don't like that one i'm making up my own and has created these things these bondages these things that have drawn them away from the heart of god god stepped in and said okay i'm gonna make a way then jesus paid the price jesus came and paid it all and for some who might be new to this message it is the story of the cross so you see crosses everywhere and maybe you don't know what it means it means that literally god came in the form of man and gave his life for all of us all the wrongs all the sins all the places where we had fallen short of what we should be and what we should do and who we should who we should be in relationship with god jesus paid the price for that so that on this side of it all we have to do is say yes all we have to do is say, I receive that gift and I choose the life that you have for me. And I give up the life of my own, my own choosing, my own ways. I'm, I'm accepting this free gift. This is like this incredible thing. There's, um, there's a track record that, again, studies over hundreds and hundreds of years have watched when communism rises, Marxism, Nazism, all the isms. When Christianity is shut down, persecuted, people are tortured, killed, messed up, it actually excels in the underground. Why would that be? Why would it be that people aren't willing to walk away from Christianity when their life is on the line, when their children's life is on the line, when their businesses are being stolen, when their houses are being burnt? Currently, we just received a prayer request from our churches in Pakistan. Hundreds of them have had their houses burned, um, churches torched, like lives are on the line. They're not asking to get out of it. They're not walking away from Jesus. They're just asking for prayer, to stand, courage, grace, and that the gospel would spread. Why? Why would you stand when that's what's going on? Because it's real. Because it's real. Because literally, you have been so impacted by the power and presence of God in your life that no threat is going to cause you to walk away. That's a really big deal, right? That's a really big deal. Life threatened, but Jesus is everything. This is what God calls us to. A lot of people have just pursued the idea of like, okay, well, if there is a God, then, I mean, find the God of your choosing. I wanna leave us with this today, and I'm gonna have the worship team come, but John 14, six, straight up, Jesus said this. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And as harsh as that sounds to some, when we listen with our heart instead of our ears, because eternity is in our hearts, because we have an instinct towards God, because there seems to be some measure of craving that pursues something that we're missing. When we listen with our heart, we recognize the truth when we hear it. We're shifting into a, a new program. Where we'll talk about it um, in the next couple of weeks. But basically, you're going to be hearing some of the stories of people in this house who have had encounters with God. And it's going to blow your mind. Sometimes I can't even sleep at night because of I just heard somebody else's story and what God has done in them and through them and for them. And I'm just like, I'm so blown away by how good he is. Miracles still happen all the time. God still is at work all the time. Literally, he is alive, active, speaking to us. There is no God of the past. There is no imaginary mystical being. There is a real God who in real time puts a draw in our hearts. And when we listen to stuff like this, we are obligated to respond. So there's, there's kind of two groups of us today. Some straight up need to respond to him. You're like, yeah, that is the thing I've been missing. And I need to make that decision. I need to, I need to step into this and we'll see. We'll see what comes. It's just a first step. Saying yes to Jesus is just a first step. And then the journey is so exciting. So exciting. But then there's a whole nother group of us. And I'm just, I'm, this, is not a, this is not a spanking. This is an invitation. But honestly, we need to be serious about this. We need to be serious about this. Our children and our children's children's future depends on it. How important is God in our lives? How important is prayer in our homes? How important is instruction in the word in our families? How committed are we to the purposes of God for us? How big is our yes to him? Are we just worried about what happens when we die? Or are we ready to live for him? Are we ready to say, I'm actually not ashamed of the gospel? Because it's good. The good news actually changes lives. Just before we close today, I'm just going to ask you if everyone would close your eyes. Just get into that space. I want you to just quiet your hearts before God today. We just want to be still with Him. I love it when science and knowledge and thought backs up what the Word already says. Because it happens all the time. But more than what people think, it matters what God thinks. It matters what the plan was from the beginning and it matters what we know on the inside when we are quiet enough to listen to him. And so this morning, I just feel like there's some, there's probably some online and I know there's some in the room that you need to give your life to Jesus. You need to give him that yes today. And I believe that there's some who have just been really kind of weak with it. You sort of prayed back there somewhere, but even today you're like, I need to get I need to get serious with God. So in a minute I'm just going to ask those who are in that category if you just raise your hands and and give your yes to God and we're going to pray together. Yeah, I see that hand in the back. If that's if that's you today and you need to do that. Yeah, I see that hand. Let's just raise our hands before the Lord. I see that hand. You see those hands. Yeah, I see those hands on this this side here up in the balcony. Is there anyone you need to give your yes to Jesus today? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I see those hands. You can put them down. Is there anybody else today? You need to give your yes to Jesus. Yeah, I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else today? Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you. You can put it down. Anybody else today? Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you. This is a holy moment. It's really between you and God. That's why everybody's eyes are closed. I'm just agreeing with you. Anybody else today? 
Yeah, I see that hand. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Lord. Okay, we're going to pray a prayer together today. And bless you online if you're making this decision. Just pray along with us and pray it out loud. But we're going to, we're just going to give the yes to Jesus. And I know that for some, maybe you're hearing all of this for the first time and it's like, I don't even know what I'm saying yes to fully. But you're saying yes to God. You're giving your life to Jesus. You're accepting forgiveness and cleansing and you're beginning on a brand new journey with him that literally is going to change everything. And um, I'm not gonna promise you that life's gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be good. And the presence of God in your life changes everything. Let's stand together and just honor the Lord. And I'm gonna ask everybody to pray this together. We're gonna support and join those that are praying it. And just repeat after me today, Father God, I come before you today and I thank you for placing in me a craving for you, for allowing me to know I need you and for drawing me by your love and your wisdom and your forgiveness. God, today, I declare that I believe Jesus is the Son of God that he came to earth to die for me, to pay the price, that he rose again, that I could be made new. God, today I'm asking for your forgiveness, for your cleansing, and I'm giving you my yes. I'm giving you my heart. I'm laying down my life and I'm picking up the life that you've given me. I thank you for a new beginning, a fresh start, and a, a life on the inside like I've never known before. And I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.